If we were to be completely logical about the places where we choose to live and found our cities, we really wouldn't live anywhere near the places we call home today. I mean, who in their right mind would found one of the world's most prolific tech capitals in a place riddled by seismic faults like San Francisco? Or for that matter, who would build a metropolis of over 22 million people on a lake, on a body of water? And we're actually no better. We've chosen to live in a place that's riddled or at least threatened by tropical storms five months out of every 12, every year. And we call this home. As the bramble of storm tracks that you see here, these are all the winds over 75 miles an hour that have hit Florida in the last 100 years. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico on the south coast. And when I was a kid, I used to think that the mountains in the distance were sleeping giants. They would leap out at any moment from their sleep. And we used to ride horses and make our own slingshots. And actually, I remember one time when we, put a, we managed to fit a baby calf in the backseat of my father's VW Beetle and drive it around the farm. So I'll give you a moment to think about that image for a second. <laughs> it really is amazing that we survived. From Puerto Rico, we moved to Venezuela and spent uh, some amazing years there. Uh, and then it was time to move again. First to Texas, then to Colorado, then to Virginia. Uh, my folks finally settled there, and then I went on to study my undergrad in engineering. Uh, and once I graduated, I became a U.S. Naval officer, and I had a chance to sail the Atlantic, the Persian Gulf, Southeast Asia. I lived in Japan for three years, as the last of three, three, the last three years of those four. And I learned a lot during those, those years. Um, really, it was about a profound respect for the natural world, for the ocean and for the diversity of the world's landscapes. So when I look, we fast forward today, uh, my professional arc has taken me from engineering to landscape architecture. It's allowed me to design and build places like this, uh, where art and environment come together, and nature is given a place, a place that allows for us to transform the places where we uh, have uh, where we work, where, where we come together, it makes them feel much more complete. And it kind of respects or brings in the irrepressible qualities of our natural world. Ultimately, I, I believe, I have great hope that when we combine our fundamental legacy as problem-solving human beings with our creativity and our desire for innate beauty, I think that's a really powerful mix. And so people have done this beautifully before. This is Alexander von Humboldt, whom just, you just heard about. And when done right, science can be this beautiful thing that explains our natural world. And actually, it's, it's remarkable, because if you think about it, a couple hundred years ago, we relied on stories, we relied on poems, we relied on prints and paintings to explain the natural world. And that was enough. That was enough to... Uh, propel, you know, empires to bet their fortunes in seeking new frontiers in this new age of exploration of the natural world. And so today, uh, it's a little bit different, but we have access to amazing amounts of information. It seems like dozens, if not hundreds, of books and websites and documentaries get published every year. And so you'd think that this remarkable amount of information, coupled with our technological prowess, would somehow have solved all these global and environmental issues that, that continue to uh, plague us. And so when you think about that, it's not that all this technology has been applied to get us closer to the natural world. In, in a way, it's kind of get, gotten us a little bit farther from it. Um, and out of sight has become out of mind. And so when you think about the fact that over half the world lives in cities today, and much of it in this tropical and subtropical band, uh, where three billion people live today, and that projection's expected to rise to six or seven billion by 2100. I mean, we've seen in the last year how we've battled with natural disasters of, of all kinds. Um, it's equally true that there's an environmental crisis as much as there is a crisis of communication about these things. And more precisely, a crisis of visualization. Um, at a time when, ironically, we consider ourselves a visual culture. And so, for the last decade, I've been working on the Ecological Atlas, which is a visualization model, a tool that tries to understand the patterns and the seasons and the logic of the natural world. 
a tool that tries to bring together this formidable combination of art and science and technology together to help us understand what's around us. To most people, the natural world is a mystery. You see this confounding amount of you know, information that is a little off-putting and overwhelming. And trust me, I'm a landscape architect, I know this. And I felt that way before I became a landscape architect. So if we could take that information and organize it in a logical and intuitive way, and you see here, this is a visual calendar that shows from January to December, from left to right, when things change, when they flower, when they lose their leaves, when they bloom. You could, if we were in Miami in March, walk outside, see this yellow, bright, blooming tree, and know intuitively that it was Tabebuya Caraiba, that it was native to Brazil, that it wasn't so great in hurricanes, and maybe with this knowledge, armed with this information, maybe we would plant in more protected areas, or maybe we would diversify our palette so that when we do have a storm, we would have a more survivable landscape. Outside on a summer's day, we might go on a walk and see this bright red flower and immediately, immediately be able to tell that it was a native flower, beach blanket flower, that it was great for soil stabilization, wonderful for storm surge. Maybe we would plant other things that were more vulnerable and still retain a certain palette that had this robust ability to survive. And we could do that for all of these living things as we've done here. This is an alphabetical uh, catalog of wildflowers of Florida. We've cataloged over 100 of them, organized them alphabetically so that you can look them up. But that is data that you could just simply rearrange if you wanted to know, for example, bloom times. On the far left, the calendar here is on the vertical axis. You understand when the early bloomers happen and when the late bloomers happen on the far right. And this slow, gentle drift would allow us to design landscapes that had an overlap in terms of their bloom time. So we would have interest year round. That same information could be arranged by color. So if it was important to you to plant a garden that was native to Florida, drought tolerant, that bloomed from February to May and it was lavender, you could sift through this terabytes of information and quickly identify what your choices were. And who wouldn't want that? And who wouldn't want to do that when you have to contend with all this information and rely on experts and websites and all these sources that are truly overwhelming? We've done this in a way that I affectionately call an artisanal way. We've assembled this data by hand. And as the next step in the process, we're looking to, to create a digital tool that will automate that. Frankly, I can't wait for that to happen. Because if lunch looked this good, and you knew that it was local, and it was in season, and there was a way for you to know that it was both, you might not care about farm to table or sustainability or resilience. You certainly want to have that lunch, though. And so we've taken that information, and we've cataloged things like butterflies and birds and fruit and fish. And while understanding these things individually is extremely valuable, it's far more powerful to look at this as a complement of relationships. And look at, for example, over 350 birds like we have for Florida, and map them in such a way that when you see two birds together, you know that it's mating season, and when they're almost invisible, they're not migrating through our state. And we could do this for any part of the world because the data is out there. We just have to find a way to orchestrate it and show it intuitively. And we've had the fortune to show our work through galleries and exhibits and museums, and people immediately respond to the aesthetics of the project. And then they realize that it's basically a DNA signature of their environment. And you know, there's no amount of projection or facts or figures that will convince us to do the right thing. But when you show it in a beautiful and intuitive way, you get much farther ahead in being able to make the right decision. And that's at the core of the ecological atlas. We've taken that information, we've organized it here to both space and time, and tuned to show a typical 
section of the coastline. So then on the vertical axis again, we see the seasons of how things change. But we go one step further and we arrange the different plant communities as you get close to the water and we see how they change from a maritime forest all the way down to beach dunes and near shore and seagrass beds. We think this can be an amazing teaching tool. We've also used that information to catalog the wildflowers in Florida, for example, in South Florida in particular. And out of 84, if we remove all the ones that are not salt tolerant, we see that 84 turns into 31. And that's striking in its own right. But then we use that information to map out the relationships between those plants and the habitat that it supports. On the left-hand side, that green tangle of lines are all the connections between the plants and the butterfly, uh, and the butterflies that use them for hosts so that they can lay eggs there and caterpillars can feed. On the right, as adult butterflies, those are the nectar plants. And again, if we take that data, that information, we filter out, we take out the things that are not salt tolerant, this is what we're left with. And so immediately when people look at this, I think abstractly you understand that our environment will change and it's changing. But then you're able to illustrate it and show it in a way that immediately brings that to the fore and you understand that it's not just one thing, it's all the relationships that come as a result. And so throughout this project I've learned that the things that threaten us, uh, the things that call into question our ability to survive are both um, a source of fear as much as they are a source of inspiration. Uh, we choose to live in beautiful yet threatened places. It's not because it's rational or logical, but because it pulls at our, it makes our hearts race and it makes that magnetic allure of the natural environment think differently about the places we, we call home. <clears throat> so when I look at Puerto Rico and I see how it's affected my family, my friends, my Puerto Rican landscape, my fellow American citizens, I can't help but think of a more perfect time to use that powerful mix of art and science and technology to better imagine what's around us, better understand it, and better conceive of the possibilities of what already surrounds us. Thank you.